gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell He is Woo! risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise our God. Woo! Praise our Savior. Praise our Lord Jesus Christ. He is an awesome God.
Christ the Lord is risen today. Ah, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Ah, alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Ah, alleluia. See the heavens and earth reply. We all realize, don't we, that without a resurrection, there's no crowning of a king of kings. Let's give him praise again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the cross 
and then the resurrection, Lord. We have to first have a death, and then we can have resurrection, Lord. That picture is the same in our own lives. As you told us so many times, Jesus, if we die to self and our agenda, then we can rise to new life in you and serve you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, thank you for those gathered here in our worship center today. Thank you, God, for those watching online. Lord, we just want to bring our hearts and our lives before you today. Don't let us waste the time that we have together. Speak to each one of us, Lord. Change our hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you sit down, you got about 60 seconds to greet one another if you take a minute and do that. There it is. Well, Good. greetings, my dear greetings. brother and pastor. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Hey, brother. Hey, Tina. You are so precious. Hey, Daniel, got to greet you. Thank you, buddy. Hey, Chuck. Okay, let's go ahead and sit down. For some of you here, you are going to have the rest of the afternoon to visit with one another. If you don't have plans afterwards, we'll be meeting in the John 6 Cafe for some refreshments. We invite you to stay after with us and if you are a guest here today and you did not pick up a gift bag that we have for you if this is your first time here be sure to see one of the ushers as you leave today and for all of us here there's a connect card in the pew holder in front of you and some of you may notice that we've replaced all the pencils there with new pens and and if you'd like to take a pen home with you, feel free to do that. We've got plenty to replace them with, okay? So fill out your Connect card. If you have a prayer request, put it on the back. Put it in the offering box as you leave, and that would be great. Now here's your ministry guide for all the things that are going on here at Pollock Pines Community Church. The workday scheduled for the end of month has to be postponed, so we'll keep you posted. We got men's retreats, women's retreats, youth retreats. Pay attention to your prayer guide. Two last things. I want us to make sure we continue to pray for Ukraine, continue to pray that the advancing troops would be repelled and return to their homeland. And uh, let's pray for the humanitarian efforts Let's pray for God's work to continue being done. And lastly, I'd like us to remember to pray for our own country. I think so many of you have realized we're just kind of on a downward trend in every area. So let's lift up our country to the Lord while you're gathered around the dinner table whenever. God bless you all. We're glad that you're here today. Let's continue to worship.
lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope.
Praise Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise our God. Our living hope. You're all we've got, and you're all we need. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you for claiming us, for making us yours through your death and resurrection. God, we ask now that you would touch us, that you would speak to us, that you would put your words in pastor's mouth that would go directly to our hearts, that you would change us from the inside out because of what you've done, because of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I just want to take a minute while our children are leaving the kids zone um, to once again thank God for our worship team. They, <clears throat> Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, they bless us and prepare us for our time in the Word. It's a time to focus on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and a time for us to focus in on the inspired Word of God, our Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to be reading some today. You've got one in your pew in front of you. I encourage you to follow along. I'll take a little bit of time for you to uh, get uh, prepared for each text. But I'm just glad that you're here. We do this every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We bring praises to God, we worship him, and we bring actually our lives before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today's message, you just can't ignore it. There are certain things in life that we just can't ignore. I mean, we've been having some rain here in the Pollock Pines area, we've got more coming. Let's thank God for the moisture. And sometimes it's going to drop below 32 degrees and there's going to be ice on the road and you're going to see a warning that may say, beware, black ice ahead. So thing that we need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention, and I know most of us do, when we turn on the news and it doesn't matter what program, but they go to Ukraine and you have the warning, beware of some of the images that you're going to see viewer discretion advised. We have to be careful. We have warning signs of our own health that we need to be careful of. I remember years ago, I had some scabs on my forehead and I just kept peeling them away, putting on some lotion and cream. Peggy has some great lotions and cream. But I walk into the doctor one day and the doctor says, you need to go see a dermatologist. And she looks at me and says, Jim, what in the world is going on? Well, here over the next five years, uh, skin grafts, over 50 stitches. I tell you, I'm glad I didn't ignore it. There are certain things in life that we simply cannot ignore. Likewise, we cannot ignore historical events that were confirmed by hundreds of eyewitnesses and they're recorded in these scriptures that are authenticated by the historians year after year after year. And you just can't ignore the empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning. We cannot ignore it. We must engage with it. To fully understand the significance of Easter, we need to also understand the seven feasts. And for some of you that are New guests here today, this goes back into some Old Testament stuff, so I'm just going to kind of try to unpack it as best I can because there were some spring feasts that were commemorative days. They were festivals. They were things that God wanted the Jews to remember about their history, beginning in Egypt and then going through the wilderness wanderings. And so the four spring feasts foreshadowed something. If you go to the New Testament, you find the Apostle Paul and the writer of the book of Hebrews telling us that the old covenant's just a shadow of better things to come. If Peggy and I were out in the sunshine and Peggy started approaching me and I saw her coming, 
I can tell you this, I'm not going to go hug her shadow. I'm going to hug my wife, Peggy, coming up on 53 years, by the way. <clears throat> and so we need to hug the New Testament. In other words, that's where we need to land our feet in the New Testament. But let's see what's foreshadowed. First of all, back in Egypt was the forgiveness of our sins at Passover. Crucial time. And then the second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the removal of our sins. And then we have the first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, which we celebrate today. And then finally, uh, the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after Passover. These are the four spring feasts. So the story began on the very first Passover in the month of Nisan, not the month of Toyota, the month of Nisan <laughs> in, in about 1450 BC. Discrepancy on the historians, which Pharaoh was it? that the children of Israel escaped from. There's another Pharaoh in about 1200 BC. This is the traditional date. So God comes to Moses and tells him, on the 10th of the month, choose a lamb. On the 10th of Nisan, choose a lamb, a perfect lamb, an unblemished lamb. And then on the 14th of Nisan, I want you to kill the lamb and spread the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house because the last plague of the 10 plagues of Egypt is going to come and I am going to pass over the houses where I see the blood. And that's, of course, the New Testament beauty of this word today is that the Lord disregards our sin if they have been forgiven in Christ. He passes over. He does not hold us accountable for them. Jesus Christ paid the price for us. So the shadow of the first Passover became a reality in AD 30. So shadow, Old Testament, the reality, New Testament. And that reality comes in AD 30. On the 10th of Nisan, the feast of Passover, we celebrated here last week. It began on Palm Sunday. That's when the lamb is identified. Here he comes, the king of the Jews. They're waving palm branches and they're hailing him. Of course, Jesus had a different kingdom in mind than the people did, but that's when the lamb was selected. The 14th of Nisan, AD 30, that's when the lamb of God was crucified in Jerusalem. And then on the 17th of Nisan, that's where the story continues to us on Easter Sunday. It's, it's rooted in history, friends. It's rooted in the feasts of the Old Covenant. It becomes reality in the New Covenant in AD 30 as Jesus fulfilled all of these feasts. He was the reality, the shadow was before him. And really the story continues for each of us today. We have to engage with what happened on Easter. So what happened on Easter Sunday morning? The unexpected earth-shaking events on Easter Sunday. Let me just read Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his garment as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, he reminded you many times, ladies and for the apostles, come and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly then and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. Behold, he's going to go before you in Galilee. You'll see him there. I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there you will see me. Now, while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came 
into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and counseled together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole them away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And look at this. This story was widely spread among the Jews as it is to this day. Well, when was Matthew written? Written? Most believe that Matthew was written sometime between 50 and 60 AD. So this story about a stolen body was already around for 25 or 30 years. They came and stole, okay, what if they were, did come and steal the body? They overpowered the guards, moved the stones, stole the body. Oh, and now they're preaching that he's risen. Are you going to die for something like that? Are you going to be willing to die for something that you know is an absolute lie? Of course you're not. On the day of Pentecost, Peter summarized what went on 50 days before on Passover. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves knew. This man was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and you guys nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death, and God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was possible for death to hold him. This was all in the predetermined plan of God, friends. From eternity past, if you want to get a little theological here, God in his foreknowledge knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin and the world would be plunged into sin. And then God knew that he had to provide a savior. Uh, the blood of a lamb, as Peter said, our Lord was crucified and redeemed us by precious blood. The blood is of a lamb without blemish and spot. This was part of God's plan and it was worked out in the events of Easter week. And then verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Friend, it's his resurrection that makes him both Lord and Messiah. That makes all the difference in the world. And Acts 4.12, Peter in another sermon on the events of Pentecost said that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me jump forward a little bit into the book of Galatians. Paul writes, if we could be saved by religious ritual or by doing good works, then why did Christ have to die? He didn't have to die. He could have just said, hey guys, Here's a new set of rules. Go out and love one another. Do your best. No, Jesus Christ went to the cross. He had to die for us, which tells us that that's the only way, as Peter says in the scriptures. So what if Jesus never rose from the dead? Have you ever thought about that? Then God is a liar. In Psalm 1610, the scriptures say that God will not abandon his soul in Sheol or Hades. He will not allow his Holy One to undergo decay. If Jesus underwent decay, as David wrote on the, from the mouth of God in the Psalms, then God's a liar. Jesus is also a false prophet. Because Jesus said many times, I'm going to be crucified, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Jesus said it at Caesarea Philippi, halfway through his ministry. He said it two other times before the evening of the last summer. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus knew he was absolutely going to go to the cross. Peter and the other apostles then are all false witnesses because they're proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead when they knew they had just stolen his body. 
What kind of crazy person would die for knowing that what you're spreading is a lie? That's crazy talk. Paul says something else over in 1 Corinthians. This will be our last text. If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses. There it is again. Because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he didn't raise. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ is raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we'd hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitying. Excellent discussion this morning in the adult uh, Bible class that meets every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock about what did the people know that was going to happen to Jesus? What if he were not raised from the dead? It was a really good discussion with lots of key points. If there's no resurrection of the dead, if Jesus was not raised, there's no resurrection, period. There's no resurrection because Jesus was raised from the dead then our proclamation is worthless. All the preaching you hear at Christian churches around the world, it's just plain worthless because the crucifixion and resurrection are the focal point of all preaching. It's Jesus who died for our sins. It's Jesus who rose from the dead. He lives in heaven today, and that's the basis of our Christian life. Then we're all liars and false witnesses. If you're a Christian here today, you're telling people, come on to church with me. We're going to celebrate the resurrection. You're a liar, too. Our faith is worthless. Man, That's uh, you might as well just do something else. Then we're still in our sins. If Christ is not raised, if can you imagine worshiping a dead Savior? Of course not. We're still in our sins if he's not risen, and there's no hope for those who die. Many of you here have lost loved ones that, are, that know Christ, and you're looking forward to seeing them in heaven. If there's no resurrection, that isn't going to happen. And then if your only hope is in this life, then you are supposed to be the most pitied, and indeed we are. And if Jesus was not raised, there's more to say, then our faith is reduced to a moral code and a set of religious practices. Friends, that is not Christianity. That is not who we are in Christ. It's not about a moral code. Yeah, Jesus told us to go love one another. And it's just not a bunch of religious practices in some church. That's, more, that's not what our faith is about. We have no spiritual power if he is not risen, and we have no spiritual life. That's one of the most crucial things. But what if Jesus really did rise from the dead? Let's check it out. Our sins have been forgiven. If you confess your sins to Christ, he's a living savior. He can forgive your sins. Our testimony is truthful. Our faith is genuine. You can plant your feet on your faith. We are assured of our own resurrection. That grave is not your final resting place. Amen. We are assured of eternal life. We have access to spiritual power. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 that I want to experience more of his resurrection power. We have power, but he wants to experience more, and then we have access to spiritual life. This life is a gift of God. I want to talk about that for just a minute. In the Gospel of John, at the very beginning, John talked about Jesus. He said, in him was life. And this life was the light of men. You see, there's two kinds of life in the Greek New Testament. There's zoe, pardon me, there's bios, from which we get physical life, flesh and bones. But then there's Zoe, we get spiritual life. That's what Jesus came to give us. 
we read in the Gospel of John, and Miles has done such a great job going through the Gospel of John. He's the bread of life. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you eat of me, if you keep having your quiet times and you read the scriptures and you read our daily breads and you keep feeding on me, you're never really going to be hungry spiritually. I'm the water of life. Jesus said, if you drink of me, you'll never be thirsty. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to know the way, I am the way. If you want to come to the Father, that's the only way. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He says, if you believe in me, you'll never really die. Your body will go in the grave, but you're just going to change your address. The real you is going to be with the Lord. And then at the end of the Gospel of John, John writes, I've written these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And let's tack another title onto that. He's also the son of the living God. And that by believing in him, putting your faith in him, your trust in him, you may have life. You see, friends, this is what Jesus came to give us. He didn't come to give us a moral code or religious practices. He came to give us life. And in John chapter 5, he's attacking the religious leaders. You guys read those scriptures, Old Testament, and you think that in them you will find life. But you refuse to come to me so that I can give you life. Jesus provided an invitation in the Gospel of Matthew. Come to me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will not only give you rest, but I'm going to add, I'm going to give you life. You just need to come to me. And so the resurrection, friends, of Jesus Christ, you and I, we simply cannot ignore it. It's the turning point in history when Jesus died for our sins on Good Friday and rose again we can't ignore it. Don't let another day go by. If you have been ignoring it, it's a truth to be acknowledged. But listen to this, friends. It's an opportunity for you to find new life, to find peace with God, to find assurance, to find a relationship with the living God, to be transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit. And that's what the resurrection is all about. Let's pray about that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I know that there are out here in our audience today, there are some who just have been looking for something to fill that empty hole, Lord. The grave is empty, and you're living today to fill the empty hole in our hearts. So God, I just want to pray a prayer on your behalf. If it's coming from your heart then this is a prayer to the living Savior. Lord, I've been running from you too long, God. I just come before you. I bring all the garbage in my life, all the doubts and the fears and the pride, the independence, and I lay it at your feet. Lord, I don't want to ignore the cross, and I don't want to ignore the resurrection. Father, I invite you to come into my life if you are the living Savior, you can do that. Because you're alive, I invite you to do that, Lord. Come into my life today. Thank you, Lord. And for all of us here today, Lord, let me live our lives with resurrection life, knowing that Jesus is alive and well in my soul. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was
was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you hid me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid a debt I owed. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. I have been transformed by the blood. Glory to His name. Church, sing this with me if you know it. Glory to His name. There at the cross. There at the cross was the blood of Christ. Glory to, sing it. Glory to Praise our Jesus. Praise our God. We have a God and a Savior that loves us so much.
have our being. You are Lord of all, Lord of life, Lord of death. You have conquered it all. We are in awe of you and what you have done. Thank you so much for making a way for us and calling us your own. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, may you go forth in the joy of his resurrection. Because in him, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. His body, the bread, his blood. 